just beginning. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. As Mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, the son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because the what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. This is for save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. And they were born in Emmanuel, which means God our with us. I'll pass you over to Esther for the Bible Memory Challenge. Okay, it's great. Wonderful. Thank you, Pitsy. Uh, we have a few things to cover this morning. So first of all, uh, I will ask Richard to come and uh, just introduce uh, the team to us, and uh, one of them is going to give a, a short testimony. So it's always great to have a Richard and Louisa and the team show. Shall we give them another warm welcome? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I've got a hand up at the back there. That's good. Well done, Jim. Uh, Rasmus is ready. Right, okay. Um, just to introduce the. I'm, I'm from All Nations. My name is Richard. My wife is Louisa, who is here, just for those of you who have not seen us before. Um, we run a cross cultural mission training course for 10 weeks, uh, three times a year. And uh, we have eight students at the moment, four of whom are here with us this morning. <laughs> so, uh, in no particular order, I will ask the. I'm, I'm going to get the family to stand up first. Is that okay? So, this is Ida and Sabina, and they're wonderful kids. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, they are all the way from Holland. Um, uh, Ida is a pilot. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Very good. Um, and they are with Mission Aviation Fellowship, MAF, uh, Holland. They don't quite know where they will be placed yet, uh, but it could be somewhere in Africa, Asia, or Latin America. So there you go. <laughs> Is that right, Ida? That's, that's about the, the long and short of it. So they are about to be deployed when they uh, are finished at All Nations. Uh, secondly, we have the illustrious Bert. Will Bert just stand up? There he is. He's a, he's a uh, Bert is also from the Netherlands and he is also a pilot. So you have two pilots with you this morning. And uh, Bert, they're still working out what, there's also a Mission Aviation Fellowship in the Netherlands and they are still working out where to place Bert, uh, but it will probably be somewhere in Asia. Okay, so that's Bert. So please go and talk to these guys after the service. Uh, and then, last but by no means least, as we say, uh, there is Rasmus. Okay, so this is Rasmus. Uh, Rasmus is all the way from Denmark, so just a little bit further up from uh, Holland there. And Rasmus knows where he's going. Okay, Rasmus, uh, he uh, is working with uh, an agency in Holland called BDM. I'll let him give the Danish. What did I say? Oh, hold on, sorry, Denmark, BDM, Denmark, okay. Uh, I can't say the name in Danish, so I will let Rasmus do that. And he is on his way to Tanzania. Okay, well, so very good. So I'll let Rasmus come and he'll just share a couple of minutes um, what he will be doing there. Yeah, that will take time. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm from Denmark. My name is Rasmus. I am, um, I grew up in a family with no Christians, but traditional Danish uh, Christmas uh, goings. So we would do it for, uh, you know, uh, we would be baptized in the church and we would uh, also have confirmation and all of that stuff. But I became a Christian, I choose to follow God, and since then 
everything's just going step by step. So first, a trip to Nigeria. Then, a trip to Nigeria. <laughs> and third, a trip to South Africa. And now I'm here for the first time in the UK because I'm training to go out to Tanzania. And I'm going out with uh, it's translated as the Moravian Church of Denmark's mission. So I'm hired as a missionary. I'm not uh, traveling out like the other guys are, uh, where they have to fund themselves. Um, I am being funded, and I'm blessed by that. Uh, and what I'm going to do in Tanzania is very strange, because we are trying something new. So I'm just being placed in a church, and I have to just be there and uh, serve them in the best way that I can. So that will be um, helping them, advise them into how to uh, do all the administration in the church. Because this church is very different in the Danish context, it's very, very different from us. Um, there are 50,000 members of this church in this province where I'm going. Uh, the province is quite new, it's separated uh, from an even bigger province that was on 100,000, 100,000 people. Um, but now, 50,000 people, only 40 uh, pastors. So we are trying to build up the capacity of pastors, of evangelists, um, and we are building a school for that. And it's not finished. Uh, and we will have the first term in June. And I will be in Kigoma, Ujiji, uh, at April. So we have only three months to finish it up and make uh, everything ready for the first term. Um, so that's uh, quite exciting. Yeah. And hopefully in 10 years I will not be, uh, they don't need me anymore. That's my plan. I want to, to leave a well functioning church and Let me just pray. Uh, I have to say, I saw the vision statement of your church for 2020, and I was excited. I was really excited. Intercultural church, missional church, church planting church, and uh, that, that's right, is it? Yeah, and, this, and this is for, for. I was I was blessed when I read that. So I'm really excited that that uh, the Antioch Church vision is that right? Is that what it's called? So I, I'd love to just pray for that, and then if we just give these guys, we'll just pray for them as well. That would be super. Okay, let's do that. Father, I just want to say what a blessing it is to be back in this church. I, I bless you for the brothers and sisters here, the friends uh, that Louisa and I have in in this place, and. Uh, Father, I thank you for everyone that is here. I thank you for the vision that you've laid on their hearts, Lord. Uh, I thank you for this multicultural, intercultural, intergenerational mission uh, that you have called them to in this multicultural part of the city, Father. And Lord, it is their heart's desire to reach London and to reach the UK uh, from where they are here. And Lord, I just pray your anointing upon them, your resourcing upon them, your wisdom and your discernment in them, Father, as they carry that vision forward. And Lord, we bless you because they have blessed us as missionaries. And Father, we as a church bless those that will be going out from us. We bless Bert. Uh, we bless Rasmus and Sabina and Ida, Lord, as they go to various parts of the world, Lord, to further your kingdom and to be part of your mission in those different locations, Father. So we just lift them up to you. Let them go in your speed, Lord, with your power, your strength and your protection, I pray, Lord. We lift them up to you and we thank you that you are continuing to deploy people around the world from everywhere to everywhere. And we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
you very much, Richard. We salute to all those people who are going to be uh, so corners of the world as a missionaries, as a local church. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay, I almost feel like having a break and have a you know a cup of tea after, after this. And uh, it's nearly 10:30. We haven't started this preaching yet. So, uh, uh, but uh, as Tom said, uh, children, can I just say again? That words you memorize will, will remain with you for the rest of your life. I still remember those memory verses that I memorized when I was in Sunday school. So well done. That's the most important thing, okay? And uh, so excellent, very good. Okay, so if we can have a quickly the PowerPoint up, yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to look at this uh, passage just very quickly. <laughs> This morning, the Gospel of Paul. Uh, Let's just see whether this is working. Okay, maybe press the Okay, I was in a bank uh, in Modern High Street last week, opening a new personal bank account. Uh, and uh, I was in this uh, customer service room uh, with this lady. And, uh, you know, obviously, you, you, you make an appointment and you go through details and checking everything. And she, among the questions, she asked me, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a church minister. Oh, how are you, she said. And where is your church? I said, in Rains Park, uh, close to White Shores. Oh, I know that, she said. When did you start working there? I said, well, from October 1995. And by that, she was quite surprised that someone would work in the same church for such a long time. And how long is that, she said. Well, maybe 24 years, 20, 24, 25 years. Uh, and then she said, uh, what's the church name? Well, it's called London Full Gospel Church. Then she asked me something really interesting. That's why uh, I'm sharing this story. She, she, she asked me, what does gospel mean? I thought that's very interesting. I'm in a, uh, in a high street uh, bank and uh, you know, in, in the middle of the business conversation. But then all of a sudden, she's asking me, what does the word gospel mean? Now, I knew I had to be quick. Uh, maybe other customers were waiting outside. So maybe, you know, one or two minutes, okay? So I couldn't hesitate. So without any hesitation, I said, well, the gospel means good news. And the good news is Jesus Christ. Uh, what he has done for us. The coming of Jesus Christ, in fact, that is what Christmas is all about. Christmas is Christ must, must meaning worship. So Christmas is really about worship of Jesus. That's why we celebrate Christmas. I said, ah, he said, she said. And so, you know, we carried on the business part. Uh, so uh, the gospel, you know, the gospel of hope this morning. And uh, this is the Advent Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent. And uh, there are themes in Advent, four themes. Uh, called, yeah, hope, peace, joy, and love. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at this. Uh, uh, themes taking a rather traditional uh, approach, uh, the gospel of hope. So if you go to the next one, uh, now even though between the Old Testament and New Testament, it seems like in the Bible it is seamlessly linked from one to the other, but there's actually a gap of 400 years, uh, what is often called the intertestamental period. Now although the Bible, the Bible doesn't record anything about this period, uh, a lot happened, uh, some significant changes took place in this period, 400 years, okay? Politically speaking, there was a rise and fall of empires, so from the Persian Empire at the end of uh, Old Testament into Greek Empire, Alexander the Great, and then, to, and then to the mighty Roman Empire, Julius Caesar. So by the time when we open the Old, uh, New Testament, it is the uh, Roman Empire, okay? And, and so people were under Roman occupation, and operation, operation uh, will have taxes and military conscription. Spiritually speaking, God was very much silent during this period. The last prophet was Malachi, 400 years earlier, and before John the Baptist appears on the scene, there was silence for 400 years. God didn't speak. So politically, socially, spiritually, this was very much dark time, hopeless situation. Forget about the Brexit and all the uncertainty that it brings. 
uh, in our time, okay, this was a dark time. It was a lot harder, hopeless situation. Then on a personal level, when we open this passage, uh, we see Joseph and Mary, and Joseph is the main character here, and he says in verse 18, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child. Now that was unthinkable in those days when a lady is married to, uh, pledged to be married to, to a man, and she's found to be pregnant. That's unthinkable. If you remember uh, uh, the film Nativity, which was released a few years ago, uh, he was devastated. Joseph was devastated. In fact, the whole family of Mary uh, were devastated by this news. She's pregnant? Who is who this? this? Okay. So uh, in, 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 you know, in those days, that was a very, very serious, uh, serious thing. Okay. So I like the way Joseph reacted. And I want to call him a man of truth and grace. And it says here in this verse, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. So he was a man of truth, faithful to the law. And yet, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. He was also a man of grace. A man of truth and a man of grace. And I think it's something that we can learn from this story, perhaps, you know, during this Christmas season. According to the law, uh, Mary deserved uh, to, be, to be stoned to death because that was unfaithfulness. You are pledged to be married and then you are pregnant now. You are considered unfaithful. Okay? You, are, you deserve to be stoned to death. That was the law. That was the truth. So Joseph had every right to claim that. He had every right. Okay, this is unfaithfulness. Okay? She deserved to die. She could call the elders of the town and that could, you know, what, what could happen very easily. He could have chosen that option because until that moment, Joseph didn't know that it was through the Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, but he didn't do that. He chose to go the path of grace. He must have been angry. He must have been upset. He must have been disappointed and let down by Mary. But he didn't want to expose it and make Mary feel disgraceful. He still wanted to honor Mary. So he decided to go quietly and just, okay, let's just end this relationship. It's not going to work. And, uh, uh, but let me just, you know, do this, deal, deal with this quietly. I still want to, I still want to honor uh, 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 Mary. That's grace. I think that's grace. I like that. I like the way uh, Joseph reacted in this, in this story. We all have very strong opinions. We like to think in terms of what is right and what is not right. You know, we often say, that's not right. This is how it's supposed to be, we like to say. And even among Christians, we have very strong and different opinions. Okay? And, and I think the classic example is found in Acts chapter 15, when Paul and Barnabas, they had a very sharp disagreement. Okay, even though they had a fantastic missionary journey, they had an amazing time together, they were good friends, partners, uh, they re risked their lives together in preaching the gospel and building the church. And uh, But Paul was very much like a truth-driven person. You know, these are my principles, these are my red lines. Okay, I'm not going to compromise on my, on my principles. That's Paul. But Barnabas is more like a grace-driven person. For him, relationships are more important. So at the end of Acts chapter 15, uh, 15 we, we see the situation that, uh, you know, uh, Barnabas says, let's take Mark with us and, uh, you know, go, go back to the churches and encourage them. And Paul says, no, 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 we are not going to do that because he deserted us. He, he let down us. Okay? So they disagreed on this, uh, on this matter. They thought this is good, I, you know, this is great that we go back to the churches and, and encourage them, but they just couldn't agree whether they should take Mark on board or not. Paul was very much choose through the principle based and the task oriented, work oriented, goal oriented person. Whereas Barnabas was very much like, let's give a more, more chance, shall we? You know, he's only a young man. Yes, he made a mistake. But uh, you know, let's give him a chance so he can rectify. We all make a mistake, Barnabas said. But Paul doesn't listen. So this is what he says in verse 9. They had a, such a sharp disagreement 
that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark, went one way, and Paul chose Silas and went the other way. Okay. So highly committed Christians, spiritual Christians, we can see uh, they have very strong opinions and very different styles <coughs> and uh, different opinions uh, on, on, the same, uh, on the same matter. And they parted company. Was it a bad thing? Well, not necessarily, because before they had one mission team, now they have two. Okay? Although the Bible's fo focus is on, on Paul and his team. Okay? So they are covering wider areas uh, of, of, the, of the field. So, so we, can see, we can see here, uh, you know, we, we, we can have a disagreement. Okay? And the interesting about this is that it happened in Antioch, this multicultural, intercultural church. As I was thinking about this, I realized what a dangerous thing to, to pray for, you know. Lord, help us to be, you know, anti Antioch Vision 22 and help us be a multicultural church, intercultural church. So we are praying for potentially a lot of conflicts, okay? That's what we are praying for. And so that's something that we need to, we need to be aware. Conflict is not a unusual thing. Conflict is quite normal. It's a normal part of growth. We can see that in the early church. The important thing is, how we manage them, how we resolve them. We have conflicts in family, conflicts at work, and conflicts in <coughs> church. Okay. So I like, I like this. It was a faithful to the law, and yet it did not want to expose Mary to public this uh, disgrace. Okay. I, uh, uh, I, uh, I, we, we have a, we have a couple of pastors in the main, main, main church, and uh, uh, they have young children. Uh, and it's beautiful to see them, you know, holding their, you know, their kids in their arms, you know, one year, two years, and three years, very young children, okay? And so, it's, you know, they're very cute. Uh, and every, every time I see them, I'm, I'm thinking, hmm, I used to be like that. My children used to be, you know, small, like that, okay? But then I'm asking myself, okay, back then, did I really enjoy those moments? <coughs> As a, as, a, as, a, as a father, as a young father, did I really enjoy those moments, you know, like, like those pastors back then? Okay. Uh, because when you look at, when you, when you are raising young children, yes, you know, very cute, you know, you know, fun and great, but also they are necessary, isn't it? You know, they can be messy, noisy, difficult to control sometimes, especially in service, you know, difficult to concentrate because they want to walk, run around and, you know, and nagging and agitating. And, uh, you know, it's very hard to concentrate in service. So it's so easy as a young parents, just look at, you know, the, the messy side of things. Okay. So only years later, you look at, oh, you know, I should have cherished that time more. I should have appreciated it more. I should have enjoyed it more. Okay. That's how I see it now. When we look at church life, it's the same. Things can be messy. Things can be noisy. You know, we may have different uh, opinions. We may disagree. Okay. But I think uh, it'll be great if we can actually enjoy it more, relax more, okay. and enjoy the moment. Even though it may be a bit immature, it may be a bit messy, it may be a bit, a little bit disorganized here and there, you know, especially when we are preparing for Christmas, things like Christmas, you know, there are many things to, to organize and to think, okay? So I think it would be great if we can enjoy and relax, okay, and rest in God's, uh, God's arms and God's grace. Uh, so the gospel of hope, okay? Uh, and uh, because of the time, I'm going to skip a lot of that uh, on my on my notes and the PowerPoint. But let me let's go to the uh, let's go. Uh, Jay, can you just press the button? You go next one, uh, next one, next one, next one. Yes, that's yeah. Isaiah, yeah, previous one, please. Yes, yeah, Isaiah. This is what Isaiah says. At this moment, the Lord is hiding his face from Israel. So I will kavah for me. The word kavah, Hebrew word, that that. That's the word for hope. It means, you know, you feel almost like a tension as you expect, as you anticipate, as you wait. So Isaiah says, Isaiah's time was, Israel was on decline, you know? So it was a tough time, it was a terrible time. Isaiah is one of the prophets that we read in Matthew's Gospel, okay? Uh, talking about the birth of Christ. 
So at this moment, the Lord is hiding his face from Israel. So I will kava for him. I will kava. I will hope. I will wait for the Lord. So biblical hope is always based on a person. Okay. Optimism, optimism is is you know you're looking at the circumstances and you just you just hope that things will work out. Okay. Biblical hope is not based on circumstances. It's always based on a person. Okay. That, that's what I learned. I said, I will kava, I will kava uh, for him. Okay. I will wait for him. That's the first thing. And then the second thing, if you go to the next slide, yeah. Uh, I, uh, Isaiah actually looks at, in his, in, his, uh, uh, in his book, he looks at the occasion when God delivered Israel out of Egypt. Okay, just like you know, Moses, this Exodus, okay. And so he says, he, he, he delivered us from the slavery in Egypt, and he will do the same. So let's look to him, let's hope for him. In order to look forward in hope, they look backward in the past and see what God has done. That's biblical hope. Okay, when we talk about hope as Christians, we look backward and see what happened, what God did in the past in order for us to look forward. Okay, so in this passage we see here uh, in verse 21, uh, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Okay. So if you go to the next one, please. Uh, yeah, next one, please. So what does the gospel mean? Next one, please. The gospel, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Okay. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So Jesus died on the cross. Go to the next one, please. And uh, on the cross, but he was raised from the dead. He is alive today. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And because he lives, we can have hope. Okay, based on a person, and especially the person of Jesus Christ. And Peter talks about living hope. I can have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then the next one, uh, in verse 22, he says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, The virgin will give child, and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The person of Jesus, and then God. Emmanuel, God. Okay. Now, if you go to the next one, uh, Richard, do you recognize this young lady? It's Heather, yes, she was here in June with another one wrote uh, a group you know, a few months ago and she's now in Mozambique and I'm on, on her mailing list and uh, she sent me just uh, like a couple of days ago uh, this, this uh, newsletter and uh, working about disabled children, okay? And this is what, is, what she said, Klerico, uh, Klekio, cle 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 can be pronounced, a beautiful child, okay? Uh, and, you know, disabled, uh, but his father's devoted care his fathers look in their culture, often the father the fathers are absent, the fathers are drunk, you know, don't really care so much, uh, you know, often. But in this case, for this child who is disabled, who needs a lot of care and help, okay, the father really is devoted to care for this little boy. That's one father. And then the next one, she says, but behind this door is the opposite of a father's love. So another boy called Gautha. And uh, the father is absent, doesn't doesn't care, doesn't look after him. Uh, and, and, and so this this boy behind the stove is covered with filth, nothing to eat, and uh, you know always always at home alone, uh, and and uh, you know dark, smelly, okay, because the father doesn't care. And she said through this experience, uh, the contrast between these two situations, she actually learned something of the love of our Heavenly Father, she said. So, go to the next one. In our helpless and hopeless state, He, our Father, Emmanuel God, pours out His love and grace upon us. We are dependent upon Him for literally everything, whether we acknowledge this or not. God is a good Father. He delights to give good gifts to His children, and is powerful, is powerful to be praising for His greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ. 
through whom we can be called God's children. That's fantastic, isn't it? That's fantastic. So in a hopeless situation, because of the Emmanuel God, Emmanuel God, uh, we can have the hope. And then finally, uh, it says in verse 20, uh, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. It's from the Holy Spirit. So God, God, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Going back to my conversation with this lady in a bank, she asked me, uh, when did you decide to become a pastor? How did you, you know, decide to become a pastor? And I shared my testimony very briefly and said, well, I had experience with the Holy Spirit at the age of 18. I said, well, and God really touched my heart when I was 18. And that, so I just wanted to please God. I just wanted to give my life uh, to serve God. That's how I say it is the work of the Holy Spirit. So brothers and sisters, as we enter into this Advent season, the Christmas season, uh, let's think about what Christ has done, the manual of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit. So we can, we can we can enjoy the hope that we have in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? Let's all stand together.